the Acts of the Apostles, we see the dead raised. Paul raised the dead. Peter raised the dead. But not like Jesus. They didn't raise the dead who had been buried after four days. That's a completely different ballgame. Trust me. Even Jesus didn't do it in the early part of his ministry. In the early part of his ministry, he raised Jairus' daughter and he raised the, the uh, son of the widow of Nain who had just died, you know, maybe an hour or 24 hours and they hadn't been buried. But Lazarus was a completely different, it was a completely different, you know, ball game. And Lazarus, well, they'd been dead for four days, he'd been buried, he'd been mummified. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. You know, because they had, they had bandaged him up, you know. And all, after all that, God brought him out. Turn to your neighbor and say, with God all things are possible. And I'm going to stretch your faith and say, with me all things are possible. The Bible says, he that could be there, with him all things are possible. And that's where we're going as Christians. And it's that level of anointing and the power of the Spirit of God that will close this age. And that, that's a truth that so many Christians uh, seem to be either willfully ignorant of or just, you know, just want to uh, ignore. You just can't come until that level of anointing is in the earth. Uh, we can now pay the prayer debt. It will complete the sufferings to give God a legal basis to put the devil and all these guys. And there are millions of them. Only God knows how many demons there are. When I say demons, I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking about principalities and powers, you know, fallen angels. There are lots and lots of them. So you can't just build a case against one. You have to build a case against all of them. So all of them at one level are allowed to attack the saints to build a case against each one. Oh, yes. Why do you think you're going through most of my trouble? <laughs> you know? Yeah. They have to be allowed, you know. They're not allowed. It says, you know, in, in First Thessalonians, I think it is. You know, so that you know, um, God will consider it a righteous thing, you know, to bring judgment upon them. But if they're not allowed to attack you, then there's no, there's no righteous basis, you know. So it's not just the devil alone. It's not just Satan alone. It's Satan and all his guys, each one. That because they they work in consort. You have to understand that they work as a, they work as a team. They learned all that from God. They, all the organization they have. That's how they used to operate in heaven before. They still operate in the same way. So when, when, when you are attacked, you're not just attacked by one devil. You're attacked by, there's a whole uh, 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 team, and they plan it, and they, you know, they, 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 they strategize. And they, you know, so all of them that are involved in that particular something become complicit. You know, and then, you know, we have to fulfill all scripture. All the scriptures that's bubbling in my heart. It says, Jesus told them, he said, I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets. He said, then he went on to say, he said, but to fulfill. Then he went on to say, you know, heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or tittle will pass until all be fulfilled. That has not happened. <laughs> we fulfill some, we haven't fulfilled all. Recent times, uh, maybe about, uh, maybe, I don't know, six months ago, I don't know whether it was this year or 2018, I did a teaching on fulfilling the law and the prophets. You know, and, and you have to understand there are two categories there. There's the law and there's the prophets. What's the difference? The law speaks of the ceremonial observances of the Mosaic law, basically the animal sacrifices. So those animal sacrifices are fulfilled in the New Testament by our prayers. You know, I taught on that 2005, 2006 on the spiritual sacrifice of the Melchizedek priesthood. So for us to fulfill the law, we have to fulfill the spiritual sacrifices of the Melchizedek priesthood, which will be the sin offering, the peace offering, the meal offering, and the burnt offering. We're doing that already because we have that understanding. Now, not everybody's doing that, but some of us who have understanding are already practicing that. We're already fulfilling all those offerings. We're fulfilling the sin offering, the, uh, when we confess our sins, that's sin offering. Just in my half life, that's the peace offering. The, the meal offering is praise and worship. The burnt offering is tongues groaning, travail, because it burns out the sin nature. You know, but that's, that's just one part. What of the prophets? 
you fulfill the law, and when you do those, when you fulfill those spiritual sacrifices, it will call, it is the power that you generate from that that will cause you to walk in love. The Bible says that love is the fulfillment of all the law. So you can't really walk in love without the wisdom of God, the, you know, the, 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 the compassion, the power of God, and all that is generated by those spiritual sacrifices of prayer. You can't walk in love without prayer. Forget it. It's not going to happen. Praise the Lord. That's why so many Christians aren't walking in love. You know, it's not just human emotion and all that. Then you got the prophets. Now, the fulfillment of the prophets, that's, the, the law is the foundation. When you're walking in love, uh, you have, you're fulfilling the animal sacrifices, that's the foundation that will not cause you to get the spirit without measure, or the power of God in sufficient measure that you can now use to fulfill the prophets. What does that mean? You're going to fulfill everything Moses reshadowed. You're going to fulfill everything, let me say, we. <laughs> because individually we won't, you know, there will be different groups, you know, that will do different things. But when you take all of us together with the power of the Spirit without measure, you know, fulfill everything in or, or pre prefigured, every uh, uh, character in the Old Testament, even into the New Testament, even as up to the Acts of the Apostles, are shadows what they did are shadows of what we are, are supposed to fulfill today at the close of the age. So it's supposed to fulfill what uh, um, Moses uh, foreshadowed, fulfill what Joshua foreshadowed. For example, when I just had my birthday, you know, uh, my 60th birthday, my wife uh, and Pastor Fred gave me a word about, you know, uh, the seventh day and, you know, the, the time of rest, six, six years, six decades. My seventh decade is a decade of rest. And God has spoken to me too, you know. So they, they, they just, uh, God used them to confirm it. But something very, very important there uh, uh, that, was, uh, that I was reminded of, and it is that, you know, you, you've got to be a practitioner of the Word of God for those fulfillments to come into they are full physical manifestation. They just won't happen. You know, uh, so you find uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, you find Paul, you find, you, we, we look at all of them, they are all shadows of what you and I are supposed to fulfill in the end time and, 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 and fulfill them in their fullness. And all that must happen. Jesus can't come until that's happened because he said so. <laughs> And he, he, the Bible says, the scripture cannot be broken. He said, Till I, until I come. So all of the prophets, we've done the law. And then all of the prophets, you know, everything, Moses, Joshua, you know, Joshua, for example, uh, the Bible says he would divide the land. And when God called me many years ago, I didn't even know all of this then. I didn't know the Bible as much as I do now then. I was just a young Christian, my first year as a Christian. And that word just came to me. He said, you will, you know, just like Joshua divided the land, you will rightly divide the word for an inheritance for the people. I'm just understanding it now better and practicing it. So that's just an example. So each of us, there are things in the law, in the prophets that you're going to fulfill. You know, Elisha, Elijah, you know, those things we do when we are at the end of a service. You know, Enoch, <coughs> um, Joseph, Moses, Joseph, for example, financial. That's still coming. We haven't, got, we haven't done it yet. Where, where the, the, the church will control the finances of the world. According to Joseph and according to Deuteronomy 28, it says, you know, you will lend to many nations, you will not borrow. All of that must be fulfilled. And it is as we fulfill all of that, that the last part of it, which would be, the discipling of the nations, you know, when every tongue, tribe, and kindred would have had a witness of this glory of God, this manifestation of the sons of God. Not they won't see it on television, they'll see it live. Praise the Lord. And not just television. We use television a lot. We're going to use internet and all of that. But we have to take it boots on the ground. We've got to take it to the people. Every tribe, tongue, and kindred on the earth, they will be visited by the power and the glory of God by uh, 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 members of a perfect church 
that has grown to the middle stature of fullness Christ and is manifesting uh, 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 the, the power of God, you know, the full anointing as well as borrowed anointing it, at the same quality. The quality will not be less than what Jesus did. And then it will go beyond it according to the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, the works I do you will do and greater. Now, those things are difficult for people to believe. And I don't blame them. Well, I blame them and I don't blame them. I don't blame them because, you know, when you look around, you, you haven't seen that. So it's difficult for people to believe it because if you look at our experience in the last 2,000 years, you haven't seen that much of that. You know, not talk of, you know, greater. So that's the reason for all of these things. And so we, 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 we're, 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 we need to have all of that at the back of our minds and it should be the motivating factor. The Lord speaking to me recently about motivation. You know, you know, we, we talk about motivational messages. Now, motivational messages are not bad, bad, but they're bad when you substitute them for spiritual messages. In other words, the, the purpose of the motivation for what we call motivational messages is money. It's secular success. Have a good business, make money, and all of that. And it's not, it's not wrong. It's just that it's just a very small part of a bigger picture. And when you now make it the main picture, then it becomes wrong, you know? But God wants us to be spiritually motivated. I'll share two scriptures with you. Well, number one, the Bible says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. But there is, the question is, why does he want you to prosper? Why does he want you to prosper even as your soul prospers? Why, why does he want you to prosper and why does he want you to be in health? You have to ask that you have to answer that question is it just so you can have a lot of money and you can be in good health yes but that's there's is there's a reason it's because you have an assignment if you are not prosperous and you're not in good health how can you take the gospel to all the nations so the the, the motivating factor must go beyond just wanting to make money just for money's sake or wanting to be successful for ego sake or, you know, for the pride of life. Which is, the, which is what motivates most people. Most people are motivated because I want to do well so that people can applaud me. So that people can praise me. That's what uh, Martin Luther King Jr. called, you know, the drum major instinct. Everybody wants to, everybody likes to be praised and to be, to be uh, appreciated and all of that. And even that is not wrong, but if it becomes an end in itself, then it becomes wrong. Why do I want all of that? So that I can do the will of God. Because when I'm strong and I'm healthy and I'm prosperous and I have money, then I can do what I like, in a sense. But I don't do what I like, I do what God wants. So that's my motivation. The second one uh, 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 is, in, is found in 1 John. He says that he that had this hope in him purified himself. In other words, what is motivating his living a life of purity is the hope of perfection. And consequently, a better re resurrection, better order and better glory. When I understand, as we, you know, uh, that the order and the glory of my resurrection is going to be directly related to the degree of the purity of my Christian life, then I become strongly motivated to live a pure life. That's why Paul said, he said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we have all men most miserable. He said, <laughs> look, at, look at the words of that man. He said, if I have fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? He said, for, you know, he said, he said if, 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 if it's just that we're just going to die, then, you know, I'll die. He said, I die daily. Why? I'm looking at something. I'm motivated. So our motivations must not stop at financial and secular and human success, which we will get. There's no doubt about that. If you get it, you, all that will come with it. But if, if that becomes your terminus, then you've missed it. You must go beyond that. You want to get these things so that you can be equipped to do the will of God. 
And that's why all these kind of teachings are so important to keep us on track, to keep us correctly motivated. We want to. So I now know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I know what I want to achieve, you know, and I understand, like Mommy was saying the other day, having a sense of, we're talking about the Good Morning Jesus platform, the, the anniversary on, on Sunday, you know, a high sense of responsibility. My generation is waiting for me and is waiting for you to show forth the power of God to them. So I, I, it's, it's not just, it's no longer just about me alone. I now see the big picture. So when, when I get up early in the morning, I remember the big picture. When I'm on my bed and, you know, I want to sleep, I say, uh-uh, I can't sleep. <laughs> I will not give sleep to my eyes until I have found a habitation for the mighty God. He's talking about your physical body, for the, for the mighty God of Jacob. You, so your whole life now becomes motivated by this uh, insatiable desire for spiritual excellence to become like Jesus. It consumes you completely. There's a song we used to sing years ago. We haven't sung in recent times. The zeal of God has come to me. It was in my soul a driving force that cannot be stopped. A fire that cannot be quenched. You know what you should do every day? You should kindle that fire. It must never go out. Every day that when, when, when you go to pray in the mornings, it, you, what you do is you kindle the fire so you have the fire for that day. So every day that fire is burned. A driving force that cannot be quenched. Stopped. A fire that cannot be quenched. So we're looking at Jesus, and in our last lesson, we looked at Luke 21, 22, we're in 22 now. And we looked at communion. We looked, they took the communion, and we spoke extensively on that, where Jesus uh, uh, you know, shared, that's the, what we call the Last Supper, but that was the institution of the ceremony of the communion that Christians are supposed to practice right until Jesus comes. And uh, Jesus said it to them. He said that this cup is in the New Testament, my blood. These do us obviously, you know, in remembrance of me. Paul, who wasn't there physically, but got it by revelation, said that we should do this until the Lord comes. In other words, let, let, let's paraphrase that in a very practical and simple way. You're supposed to take communion on a regular basis, representing the blood of Jesus and the life of God. The, the wine represents the blood and the life of God. So you continue to receive greater and greater measures of divine life, you know, to grow spiritually. You know, you, you judge yourself. Doesn't mean you don't condemn yourself. You look at how well you've done and you motivating to do better. You take the communion, you know, and then you use it to grow spiritually so that you can get to all the things God wants you to get. You know, and grow to where God wants you to grow. That's the whole purpose of the communion. And in doing it, you do something which is very important to the Lord. You appreciate the sacrifice that He made, the sufferings that He went through. The shame, the the, 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 the the mockery, you know, then the actual dying for physically and then spiritually going to hell, coming back. Every time you, you, you do that, you're telling God, I appreciate the sacrifice you made and I am going to make sure that it is not in vain in my own life. I'm going to make sure that the things I do as I take your blood, as I take your, your life, you know, and it's not only when you just drink the thing, you know, that every time you confess your sins and you use the blood of Jesus and you use the word of God and use that, you are eating his flesh and you're drinking his blood. And that, that's supposed to strengthen you from within to take you on onto higher heights. And then you're telling Jesus, I appreciate the sacrifice you made, making that blood available, making the life of God available, and I'm not going to waste it. That's, that's, that's in a compact form, but that's really, that's what we're saying. Look at, look at Luke, uh, where we're in 22, you know, and uh, I'm going to go to verse 24, but before I go there, we looked at this last time, but I want to, I, I didn't look at this particular verse. Look at John chapter 6. Here, Jesus was teaching prophetically about the communion. He hadn't died yet, you know, and uh, I, let's look at verse 51. I think that's, that, that, yeah. 
you know and 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 the, he was teaching prophetically like by the grace and mercy of god we're doing now there are many things i'm teaching now that haven't happened yet but they are prefigured to happen shortly for example he taught this two three years later they were already doing it you know so in a, in a similar kind of way that's that's one of the uh, 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 characteristics of prophetic teaching and so here look at what he says in verse 51 he said i am the living bread i didn't hear you which came down from heaven if any man eat of this bread he shall live forever and the bread that i will give is my life which i will give for the life of the world he wasn't talking about physical bread he wasn't even talking about just when you eat bread at the communion alone it included that but it went beyond that to using you know he you uh, the word of god as the bread of life from which you can get the life of god look at verse 52 and and they strove among themselves now verse 53 i just quickly look at that 53 to 55 so then jesus said unto them verily verily i say unto you except you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood guess what you got no zoe the life of god there is the greek word zoe zoe that's the that's the whole purpose of his sacrifice his his sufferings on the cross the beating of his back the stripes on his back the blood that he shed he's dying he's going to hell made two things available the blood and the life and, and the life of god that's the, that's how we get eternal life and we get it by the ceremony of eating the the bread and drinking the wine and using the word of god subsequently you know you can't be eating communion every five minutes praise the lord <laughs> hey, we do it maybe once in a week sometimes once a month like we do it once in a quarter the important is you have to do it regularly and then in between you use the word of god to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Next verse. 54. Whosoever, whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath what? So the purpose of eating his flesh and drinking his blood is to get what? Eternal life. Without it, no eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 55. I've got to stop there. I won't go. For my flesh is what? And my blood is what? That's what's going to give you eternal life. And sadly, most Christians, you know, they, they, they limit it sometimes just to the communion table. You know, when they come to the church, maybe once in a week or in some place, they do it once in a month. You know, and, and so that doesn't end there. That's just a physical ceremony which you do by faith and you do get life. But then you should continue the practice of eating his flesh and drinking his blood using the word of God. Constance, constantly. You should eat his flesh and drink blood every day. Every six hours. Praise the Lord. You clear with the blood. You roll ro ro with life. That's what you're doing. And you're telling God, I appreciate what you've done. And like it says in uh, Isaiah, we quote it often here. You know, it says he will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. So when he looks at your life, you say, ah, it was worth it. It was worth it the sacrifice this person appreciates what i did and he's taking full advantage of it and he's growing so that he can manifest my glory aha that it was worth my sacrifice when people don't do it he says you're guilty of the body and the blood of the lord you don't you don't appreciate the sacrifice that's what it means to take the communion unworthily you don't appreciate the sacrifice you don't appreciate what he did you're not taking advantage of it very very important Luke chapter 21 now we, we, we stopped uh, with the communion in verse 23 I believe it was Luke 22 excuse me and verse 23 that was the last that's where we stopped you know this way was saying that one of them was going to betray him which very sadly happened to be uh, Judas Iscariot who did it like we all know because of money you know we looked at that last time uh and um and you know jesus is such a nice person i have it in my notes here you know he he knew he knew judas was doing one of this rubbish he never exposed it he could have he could have sacked him long ago 
Hello? Then I got rid of him. Hello? But he didn't. In the hope that he would change. But sadly, Judas, like some of us today, sadly, you know, thought that the fact that God didn't see anything meant that God didn't know or God didn't care. You know, a lot of people are like that. When, 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 you're, when you're continuing in sin and nothing happens, there's no judgment, the fire doesn't fall from heaven. You, if you're not careful, you're lulled into a false sense of security. That, ah, oh, well, you know, don't mind them. You know, God doesn't even mind. <laughs> when God doesn't talk, they're afraid. When God is quiet, when you're doing something wrong, and it seems as if you're getting away, that you're standing on thin eyes. It's because he, 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 he's, he's, he, he's long-suffering and just should never be mistaken for weakness. The long-suffering of the Lord is salvation. He's giving you a long rope to be able to change. And when you don't change, oh, wow. It's a suddenly... You know, God's wrath and God's justice will just come. I don't know what with Judas. He probably felt that, I, you know, when I, when I think about Judas, and I like to think about him not in a negative way, you know, certainly not to be like him, but to learn from his life and his experience so that I don't fall into the same kind of thing, you know, and I can also teach other people like I'm doing now so that we don't fall in the same kind of trap. When I think about Judas, I, I've thought deeply about him over the years. You know, this was a guy who was with Jesus just like the others. Twelve, the twelve were the closest to him. He had the 72, but the twelve were the closest to him. He saw miracle after miracle after miracle. Not only that, he knew Jesus was, was God, connected to the Lord. He knew Jesus would be picking information. Jesus would tell them things, go and fish. <laughs> The first fish you catch, you will find a gold coin in his mouth. Use that to pay our tax. Why don't you be afraid of such a guy that if you are stealing from the bag, he will know? A person who can tell that the fish has a gold coin inside his mouth will not know if you are stealing from the bag. Something happened to that man. I, I think about it. I said, hey, hey. All these years, and it wasn't two weeks, it was just for three and a half years. He was seeing all the things, seeing the miracles, seeing the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, all these great, you know, Jesus would talk to the woman at the well. You've had five husbands. Yeah, you think Jesus who knew that? What do you know I'm stealing from the bag? How come his heart, he, he didn't... It tells you how hardened the human heart can become. The Bible talks about the heart being hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The fact he was doing it and Jesus didn't see anything made him could, could think erroneously either that he knew and he didn't care. It doesn't matter. We have plenty of money anyway. <laughs> yeah, they had a lot of money. It never, it never, it never, it, what Judas was taking from the bag didn't stop the ministry from going on. It didn't stop them from having to help the poor, you know, feeding the brethren and all of that. So he probably thought, mm, he has plenty anyway, so it doesn't matter. He has greatly mistaken. If it's wrong, it's wrong. I want to say a word to you about this. We're talking about Judas and we're talking about the hardness of heart. You know, if you exercise your heart in covetousness and dishonesty, it will cause your heart to get harder and harder and harder. Don't do it. Even if it is a small thing and it appears insignificant. Even if it's a small thing, it may not, it may not be hurting the person you're doing it to. You must not use that as justification. After all, I only took 10 naira and they will, they, they will, will feel it. The fact that it is wrong and your conscience tells you it is wrong and you continue to do it will destroy your conscience just as much as if it was a million naira. It's not the amount. It's the principle. It's the honesty. It's the dishonesty. 
Whether however small it is, if you continue in it, it will harden your heart, even if it's a even if it's a bigger amount. The effect, the spiritual effect, will be the same. That's what we have to learn from this uh, unfortunate fellow called Judas Iscariot. You know, he kept on at it and just didn't say anything. Jesus didn't. Of course, Jesus knew. He said, Pastor, how do you know Jesus knew? Who told John? <laughs> You know, John wrote it. But you must understand, you know, that the book of John was written after Jesus had been raised from the dead. Everything we read in the Gospels was written after Jesus had been raised from the dead. So while Jesus was still alive, John didn't know. It was later that Jesus must have told him that's what he's been doing then John could now write it and say this he said not because he cared for the poor but because he had the bag and he was stealing what was inside the very great lesson to learn sin however small if it is continued in without genuine repentance and a consistent effort to use the blood the word and the spirit to overcome it and you just accept it and say, well, that's just the way it is and all that, it will harden your heart. Don't do it. The heart is hardened through what? The deceitfulness of sin. It's one of the big problems that we're having in the church and in the ministry today. Pastors and all of that, they do all kinds of silly things that they shouldn't do, you know, immorality, money, and all kinds of things. And they say, well, you know, uh, God... God doesn't say anything about it and you know um, uh, you know uh, I still get up and I preach and there's anointing hello so they think it's okay it's not okay ask Samson Samson was continually living in immorality but the anointing didn't leave him didn't leave him the first day didn't leave him the second day watch it didn't leave him after 10 years didn't leave him after 15 years it was after 20 years that shows the patience and the kindness of God. Don't take it for granted. That's a lesson from the life of folks. A strife, strife just means argument. Among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? And he, that's the Lord Jesus, said unto them, the kings of the gender, I didn't hear you folks. I didn't hear you exercise lordship over them and then that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors but you shall not be so but he that is greatest among you let him be as the younger he didn't say he's younger he said be as and he that is chief as he that doth serve for whether is greater he that sitteth at meat that's to eat on the table or he that serveth is not he that sitteth at is is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. Yea, you are they, ye are they, which have continued with me in my temptations. That's all these three years. They were with him, you know, for all these different um, persecutions and, and dangers that he went through. Watch this. And I Appoint unto you a kingdom. Glory be to God. As my father hath appointed me. That you may eat and drink. Wonderful. At my table in my kingdom. And sit on thrones. Judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Give the Lord a clap offering. Oh my God. Oh my God. Look at what Jesus gave these guys. Now, I, I want to I blow your mind. I preach these things over the years, but each time we teach and preach them, new revelation comes. More light. Look at what they were arguing about. Who is going to be greater? Similar to the same thing they did when James and John asked their mommy to come and toast Jesus. <laughs> to sit on the right hand like that. You know, want to show who is who's, who's number one. Jesus now teaches them an important lesson. 
Then he may teach them this lesson. He now tells them the reason why what they are saying is totally unnecessary. And this is it. He said that in the world you have big men, you know, called benefactors. He said, but he will not be so among you. He said that he that is least, he that is greatest, will be as him that serves. Then he gave himself as an example. Now, I'm going to blow your mind now. He said, I am amongst you as the one that serveth. Who prepared the communion for them to eat? It wasn't Jesus. So he wasn't talking about physical service. When they were going to make the communion and kill the ram and kill the, this thing and cook the food, Jesus didn't go and do that. Just sent Peter and John said, go and find a man and they'll give you a, they'll show you a large upper room. That just, just didn't serve them physically. He's not talking about physical service. He wasn't serving, Jesus was not serving them food and, you know, he wasn't doing that. He just used that as an illustration. He was saying that the, if you want to be great, be the one that serves the most spiritually. And that's what I was teaching on Sunday about showing God's strength to our generation. And that the people who will do that, those who will, who will serve with their spirit. They serve with their spirit. How? Prayer, intercession, walking in love, revelation knowledge. And they are making the power of God. Watch this. They make the power of God available to the people under them. And therefore, by that, they are serving them. The person who is greatest in the kingdom is the one whose spirit has greater and greater capacity and is serving the most number of people. That's why I say that the servant is the greatest. One of the reasons why God is greater than all of us is that God is serving all of us. Hello? You want to be great in the kingdom? If you want to be great in the kingdom, learn to become a servant. Spiritually speaking now. You serve. You serve with your spirit. That's what Paul said. He says, I thank my God. First, Romans chapter 1 verse 9. You whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. And we, you and I need to develop that as we pray, as we intercede. You know, uh, we talk about covering. You know, you're serving a thousand people. You're serving 10,000 people. You're serving a million people. The more you're serving, the greater you are in the kingdom. That's the real service. And that's why I contrasted it. Because it, the, the, the accounts followed each other. He asked them to go and prepare the communion. He didn't go and do it. So he wasn't talking about physical service. He wasn't talking about physical service at all. He was talking about spiritual service. So he said, he that is great among you should learn to be the, you know, to be as the younger, as he that serves. Now, there's something about the Lord Jesus Christ we need to understand in these three years of ministry. We're going to read about it in a few minutes. You know, he, he served them constantly with the Spirit. Or by his Spirit, if you like, or through his Spirit. So God was channeling the power of God through Jesus' Spirit as a conduit pipe that was what was protecting, blessing, and providing for all those 12 apostles, 70, and all the people around him. Same thing with Paul. That's why, we, you know, nothing ever happened to any of them. The only unfortunate casualty was Judas Iscariot. And I'll tell you the reason why as we go along. You know, and it, it wasn't because Jesus didn't cover him. It was because he didn't receive the covering. <laughs> you know, God, God is such a... And, and you know, the other amazing thing about this account, I, would really, I, just, I just burst into laughter when I saw it. They, they, they were competing. Who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to sit on the right hand or on the left hand? Eh, she said, no, 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 no. If you want to be great, learn to serve. They said, you know what? Every one of you has a throne. You already have a throne. Your, your throne cannot take away from the other person's throne. He said, I point unto you. So the competition was totally unnecessary. Each person already had a throne. He said, I've given you 12 thrones to judge all the 12 tribes of Israel. And including Judas. Judas had a throne. 
sadly, he threw it away. To let another take his bishopric. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. But, but the, you know, the, the, the point here is this. It is foolish to compete. It is ignorant to compete, to be envious. Your destiny is secure. Your throne is secure. My throne cannot threaten my wife's throne. My wife's throne cannot threaten Pastor Guega's throne. Hello? Hello? The problem is we're not heavenly minded. So we're only looking at here. You know, I appoint unto you. The Bible says that he that overcometh will I grant to sit in my throne. There are a lot of spaces on the throne. What we see 25, that's just a sample. There are lots and lots. The Bible says we are seated together with Christ in heaven. Everybody, watch this, everybody has a throne. The problem is if you don't develop spiritually, you lose it. Which, sadly, was what happened to Judas Iscariot. You can lose it, but it's already, from the day you are born again, let me use a natural illustration. The, the Queen of England is the Queen of England. She sits on the throne. The day Charles was born, Charles is her firstborn, we call him Prince Charles. He's called the Crown Prince. <laughs> it's what? There is no argument. Whenever his mother dies, it's Charles who's going to become king. In, in, in a similar kind of way, the day you get born again, you already have a throne. <laughs> That's who you are. You're a child of God. Not only are you a child of God, you're an heir of God. You are, it's already set. But you must be prepared for it so that you can be worthy to sit on it. God is not going to give the throne to somebody who is not developed. It's going to cause problems. That's why people lose their thrones and their destinies. But if you do what you're supposed to do and grow, you will get it. And another person's own cannot threaten your own. As I was preaching, preparing this afternoon and praying, God gave me a picture. He said that, and he showed me like a kind of, um, like a chain, you know. You see, there are people, there will always be people who are ahead of you. And there will always be people who are behind you. Now listen to this, it will set you free and it will bless you. In your Christian life, you didn't drop from heaven. There will always be people who are in front of you. And then there are all people who are behind you. Now watch this. If the person that is in front of you is doing well and you help them to get their throne, so to speak, or their, their crown, because you help them and you are behind them, you can see all the things they did, it's going to guarantee you will get your own. So it is in your interest, it is to your advantage to help the people in front of you get their throne. Then that guarantees you getting your own and the people who are coming behind you will get their own. So if everybody has the right attitude, everybody's going to be fine. The problem is this spiritual short-sightedness and fool is really foolishness and ignorance that once you start fighting, say there was a strife among them as who should be the greatest. What can be greater than the throne? No answer. I said, what can be greater than God's throne? That's the ultimate development of a human being. The, 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 you have seven rewards. I preached this message in 2005. Becoming an overcomer. You have seven. I don't want to go through all of them. But the last one and the most important one is that he that overcometh, will I grant to sit in my throne even as I sight my father? You can't get better than that. Once you've got that, you've made it. And the fact that Sarah is going to sit on the throne and I'm going to sit on the throne... <laughs> Can't we, well, it's not my own is not going to disturb her own, her own is not going to disturb my own. It can only enhance it. So if she helps me to get the throne, then she too will get to the throne. 
And then, oh, why? You know, so we must learn to walk in love. We must learn to help one another because it's enlightened self-interest. If I help the other guy make it, I'm making it easier for me to make it. Hold on, Julia. Do you get it? Very important lesson. Keep that picture at the back of your mind. One person is in front, another person is at the back, another person at the back. The guy in front will get there first. But it's not going to disturb the guy who is coming behind. Because he will learn from the other person and then he too will get there. And then the other person that's behind him will also get there. The only people who don't get there are the people who try and pull down the people in front of them. And if you try and pull down the people in front of you, you won't be able to pull them down. Because God is going to help them. But instead of using you to help them, you use other people to help them and then you will now lose what you should get. I don't know if you got it. I didn't hear an amen. It was very quiet. <laughs> That's what happens. But when you're faithful in another man's, then you get your own. If you're not faithful in another man's, you can't get your own. I heard a man of God say this many, many years ago. It has stayed with me. And I've preached it. I've used it to preach many times ago. It has come to me again. Joseph's dream was is locked up inside the dream of the butler and Pharaoh. So the only way Joseph could get his dream to come to pass was by working on the dream of others. You will never get your dream if you don't work on the dream of others. Your dream is in, it's locked inside the dream of others that God has put around you. It's a great, it's a deep spiritual truth. If Joseph, watch this, if Joseph did not interpret the butler's dream, he would never have got to Pharaoh. Now, watch this. The interpretation of the butler's dream was not instantaneous with Pharaoh's dream. There was a time interval. That's where people fail. He walked on, on the butler's dream. Then nothing happened. The butler didn't remember. Two full years. Why? God was working on Joseph. Because Joseph himself had to be worked on. <sighs> Hello, Joseph. Don't your neighbor say, God's working on you. God's working on me. Don't be in a hurry. And say, don't be in a hurry. So God, Joseph, you know, he used Joseph to interpret the dream of the butler, the dream of the, of, of the baker. He was faithful in that, and then God didn't do anything. Waited two years. Then it was after two years, the butler now remembered, and then brought out, you know, and Pharaoh had his dream, then said, oh, there's a young Hebrew. Then he went to now bring Joseph. So it wasn't one dream, it was two dreams. He had to, you have to serve others. And sometimes it will be more than one person. To work, help them to fulfill their dream. Because your own dream cannot come to pass until their own dream has worked. It was the butler's promotion that opened the door for Joseph to get before Pharaoh. Without the butler, Joseph would not have gotten to Pharaoh. It's a deep spiritual truth. That's why this question of faithfulness and loyalty is, in, is, is, is intrinsic in the kingdom. You, you, you break that law, you just... You, you self-destruct, so to speak, as far as destiny is concerned. Maybe not heaven, but at least destiny. You know? Like, 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 like I shared the other day about, about Joab. Joab should not have done what he did. No matter what David's faults were, and David had his faults. We all know David's faults. You know, but, you know, he should have been faithful like Nathan. Nathan was aware of David's faults. Very aware. In fact, it was Nathan who rebuked David for the, but he never rebelled against David. The Bible says, rebuke not an elder but he treat him as a father. You, and you know, immediately Nathan pronounced the judgment. He said, you are the man. 
Then he said, don't worry. God has put away your sin. You will not die. He said, but the child, you know. And then, you know, they made it up. That's the right attitude. Joab's attitude was one to destroy. He was one to try and, you know, make a mockery of David and all that. And God didn't like that. And Joab's name is not among the mighty men of David. The day I checked that thing, I was amazed. Joab, he was the captain. But his name was not there. Uriah who died, his name is there. Go and check it. Uriah's name is among the mighty men of David. Who David killed in battle to get his wife. But in heaven, Uriah never lost his reward. Give the Lord a clap offering. You know that man, eh? I want to see the reward God is going to give Uriah when we get to heaven. You know what? It, they, 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 faithful, faithful to the cost of his life. He went, David sent for him. He said, go and sleep with your wife. He said, in me. Only my Lord Joab and the armies of Israel and the ark of God, they are in battle. Then I will not eat. I will go and sleep with my wife. Ah, he said, God forbid. He stayed in front of David's house. Throughout the night, you can imagine the inconvenience with all the cold and everything. Faithful to a... Because what Joseph, what David planned was that if he slept with his wife, then the pregnancy would look as if it's Uriah's own and not David's own. In those days, they didn't have DNA. <laughs> when David saw it, it didn't work. That's when David should have known that God is on his case. He now sent a letter to who? Joab. Joab, Nilogo Dimeru. Joab. He knew that the kind of person who can do that kind of work is Joab. Send a letter to Joab. He said, put him in the hottest part of the battle and let the guys withdraw from him. You know, you know, Joe, and Uriah didn't really read the letter. The letter was given to Uriah to give to Joab. These are, these are, you know, when you read your Bible, these are the things you need to be reading to change you and the kind of person you are. Would you have read that letter? You know what? Many of us would have read the letter. Ah, he won't go to the battlefront again when he sees the letter. <laughs> Faithful unto death. What? God, God is, you know, God is such a wonderful God. That's why this life doesn't end here. It doesn't end here, folks. The Joab who was the number one, his name was not there. The Uriah who died, his name is there. It shows the way God thinks, different from man. That's why we should be faithful unto death. I didn't hear an amen. I only heard Pastor Boega and... <laughs> And Pastor Lokba there, and um, I think Mommy and two other people. I said we should be faithful unto death. You can't say him and say, Oh, me. Because it will be tested. It will be tested. It... Yes. He said that he may be smitten. It was David who killed him. Now, he didn't kill him with his sword directly, but he killed him. It was David who killed him. And you know when the news came back, he said, well, you know, the sword falls on one or the other. It doesn't matter. Ah! I like the Bible. The Bible says, but the thing that David did displeased the Lord. I, I, I'm not supposed to be preaching about David tonight. But, folks, you know, when you look at that again, it's another lesson. This something took, this drama took over a period of one year. David sleeps with Bathsheba. Bathsheba gets pregnant. That's about six weeks. Six weeks, eight weeks before she knows. She knows it's David's own.
because her husband is in the war front and she's not slept with anybody else so she knows certainly it's David's own she sends a message to David David cooks up this plan Uriah comes home but Uriah doesn't sleep with his wife The question to ask is this. The man after God's own heart, why didn't his heart smite him? Hold on, Shanuo. Bro- brother, brother, Ibrahim has got the message. Yeah, yeah, this is a man after... I'm not talking about any funny person. I'm not talking about, you know, Amon or Manasseh. Or, I'm talking about David. Hey man, you want to ask... That's a question you need to ask. How come his conscience did not strike him at that time? You know, immediately that... Something is terrible here. He plans the boy's murder. Uriah is killed. His conscience still doesn't strike him. You haven't heard the last of it. Well, that's why I said this drama took away about a year, maybe a year and a few months. You, 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 he's, he's, uh, he takes Bathsheba and puts him in his house. She does the 40 days of mourning for her husband. Then he now takes the girl. Uh, his heart doesn't strike him. He sits on the door. Welcome. It takes nine months to have a baby. So, nine months! The baby is born. It's only after that God now sends Nathan to him. It wasn't two weeks. It tells us about our heart. That you, you can keep something wrong in your heart and keep it there for even if you love God. A man after God's own heart. Why is it written? It is written for admonition unto whom the end of the world that you have to watch your heart. With all that David knew about God, with all the revelation, this is a guy who's written the Psalms, written revelation knowledge. All this didn't happen when David was a young boy. This happened when David was in his late 50s or early 60s. This Bathsheba affair. It happened... By that time, David had written the Psalms, written a revelation, not everything, you know. The question is, God is telling us that if it can happen to David, it can happen to anybody. That's the lesson. So keep your heart with all diligence. What I said earlier on, even small things, even small things don't continue in there. The problem is not making a mistake. The problem is continuing in it. If you do it, ah, quickly you withdraw your step. But David didn't do that. He continued. He continued. He continued. His heart, those, that one year or so was the worst part of David's life. His heart had gone downhill. He was in a bad place. That was when he did all of that rubbish. And even though he repented and God had mercy on him and helped him, it affected the rest of his life and his ministry. He, he never got back to the fullness of what he had before. God had mercy on him, got him back to the throne, quenched the rebellion of Absalom, put Solomon on the throne, you know. But then he died at the age of 70. All the things that, you know, I read in the Bible, I just said, wow, this is a lesson. The Bible says that he was so weak, they had to be finding cloth to cover him so that he would get hidden. They found one small girl. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you something. You know, that, this, that, this thing that David did, and you know, even in our own modern time, it will affect you too. You will not do it in Jesus' name. What I mean is that it can it will affect the physical body. And the time it really shows up is later in life. Find that men who are strong and healthy and, and athletic and all that, when they start getting to old age, just see the man crumbling. He can't walk, he can't doubt, he can't, you know. That seems, you don't want to do it to It will affect your body. It will affect your body. 
That's why you want to keep a look at Joseph. Clean guy. He lived to 110. Imagine if, 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 if David had those 30 extra years. The Bible would be a different book. There would be no Israel and Judah. There would have been no division. There would have been no Solomon. There would have been no daughters of the East Country and all the other rubbish. Selah. So, help others you will help yourself. Be faithful and loyal to those in front of you your own too will come. He that is faithful in that which is not man, he will get his own. Praise the Lord. Let me, let me, let, 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 let's look at this last portion and then I've got to close. How many people are, are, are being blessed by this? Okay. You know, that's why we teach the Bible. It forces you to be balanced. See each of those verses, all kinds of things inside. I've said it, Ben Tampons keep saying, is it, is it complex mosaic? of literal and spiritual truths intricately interwoven that has application to all men in all ages. It is written of you in the volume of the book. There is a part of this land that applies to you. And as you are listening to me, you know it. Each one of us as individuals, there is a part of this message that is just you. <laughs> and when you hear it, you know it. Jesus help me. So he told them, all of you have thrones. So you don't need to compete among yourselves. That's verse 30. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging 12 tribes of Israel. It doesn't get higher than that. So there's no point competing and trying to fight each other and striving and arguing and all of that. Verse 31. And the Lord said, uh, Simon, Simon. I didn't hear you folks. Behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may do what? Sift you as wheat. Hmm. 2231. 2231. Oh, praise the Lord. Everybody say, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But Turn to your neighbor and say, this is the good news. I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee, both to prison and to death. You know what? He was sincere. He wasn't, he wasn't Peter was not, he meant what he said. But he didn't have the spiritual power to go through it. Like many of us. Ah, we do that. But you don't have the spiritual capacity. It's just, it's just talk. When the rubber hits the road, you can't go through it. You need a certain, there's a certain amount of spiritual strength and power that you need to go through certain things. <laughs> Verse 34, and that's going to close here. And he said, I tell thee, Peter. <laughs> Look at how he switches from Simon to Peter. Another message for another day. He called him Simon at first, then he called him Peter. For those of you who don't know, the name his daddy and mommy gave him was not Peter. His name was Simon. Peter was the name Jesus gave him. And it means rock. Stability. Simon means reed. Unstable. So when he was talking about his instability, he used Simon. <laughs> Peter, the cock shall not crow this day. Let me paraphrase that and put it in its proper context this night. At the time we are talking about, they have eaten the Passover. Usually they kill that thing around 5 o'clock in the evening, something. 
They had gone to the upper room, maybe around six, seven. It had got dark. They finished eating and everything. Then <clears throat> Judas goes out to go and we haven't got there, we'll get there next week. You know, goes out to go and do the betrayal and everything. So they're still talking and talking. So it's in that something they Jesus now said to him, you know, you're gonna betray me this night. By because twelve midnight there will become a new day. By the time they came to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane, they probably get to get they probably got to get somebody around 8 30. 8, 8 39. Just pray for three hours. That'll take us to eleven thirty, almost twelve midnight. By the time he's arrested. G- Peter follows him to the high priest's house. By the time they get there's about one AM or two AM in the morning. Is it was what's called a kangaroo court. Have you ever seen any court city except in Nigeria? I may remember during uh, Abiola's time. Uh, Pastor G, you remember? One justice with Pama or something, I can't remember. <laughs> they, 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 they did a <laughs> Nigeria, wonderful country. No, I, have you ever seen court at 2 a.m. in the morning? Where are the witnesses? Where are all the bailiffs? Where is there? Nobody goes to work at 2 a.m. in the morning. It's when you want to do wago wago. <laughs> when you want to do some, some, some trickery. You start doing court. How can you do? How can you hold court at home? two a.m.? That's when they were asking all the questions and all that. Anyway, to cut a long story short, that's what Jesus had in the back of his mind. So the cock would crow around five, just before dawn. So Jesus says, before this is one, one account. Another account says, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. In those days, they didn't have. There was no apple, so you couldn't check your, you know. So they used the cock, cock, you know, crowing of the cock to uh, say the time in the morning. He said, you're going to deny me three times. Pizza face. And he was sincere. It's like us today. The typical born against people, Christian who loves God and very zealous and all of that, but doesn't have spiritual power. Then he would start saying things he doesn't have the power to do. Ah, not my portion in Jesus' name. Ah, ah me never. <laughs> you just looked at him. He didn't argue with him. He just told him. He said before the call cross, but he had given him the good news. I got to close. I prayed for you. You're going to mess up, but I'm going to. I've prayed for you, and my prayers will cause. I'm paraphrasing. Cause God's mercy to help you. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. The rhetorical question I want to ask is this. I'm going to give you a scripture and close with it. Didn't he pray for Judas? Of course he did. He prayed for all of them. He didn't pray for Peter only. He prayed for all of them. Look at John chapter 17, verse 12. This is Jesus' prayer. John 17, verse 12. Jesus, Jesus' prayer. Now, this is what Jesus said. He was praying to God the Father. You know, and uh, he said, while I was with them, he knew he was going to die. This was, you know, the prayer uh, in Gethsemane. And, you know, I kept them in thy name. I didn't hear you, folks. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. That's all the 12, the 70. And none of them is lost. But the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He kept all of them, including Judas. He kept all of them under that covering. In thy name. What is his name? His character. So he was praying for them every day. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness. That thing was covering them. They were in the name. They were kept under that spiritual covering. Including Peter, including Judas. Now, uh, there's, this, there's, a, there's a Yoruba saying, and then my wife also makes it in five. I remember this when I was praying this afternoon. And I said I was going to share here. You know, she used to say it like this over the years. She says, you need to have an open wound. Then Yoruba say, Omotoba shipa. That means it is the child that raises his hand that the mother can carry. The covering was for everybody, including Judas. 
everybody had an open room except Judas. So that power could not work on his behalf. It was not because he wasn't prayed for. It was because he could not receive because of his attitude. He kept stealing from the bag. He kept doing his heart got hardened and hardened and hardened and hardened. So even when the light came, there was a block and the thing could enter. That's what happened. And that's why our attitude depend, determines, like they say, our altitude. Keep your heart altitude. It was the heart. It was Judas. Judas hardened his heart and hardened his heart. So when Jesus even prayed, he said, I kept all of them. While I was with them, I kept them in my, in my, in, in my name. In thy name. I used the power of God through prayer and intercession. I kept all of them under the covering of your character. That's why those things are spiritual forces, love, joy, peace. They're all spiritual forces. And you can, you go, you can, it can cover you just like you cover, you know, uh, 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 a covering. You can, can provide a covering and, and, and a protection. And all of them had it. Oh, which one of them didn't have false? Is it Peter that didn't have a false? Is it James and John that didn't have a fault? All of them had faults. The problem, I'm going to say it again, is not the fault. It's the continuing need and not doing something about it. All of them had problems. And Jesus' prayer worked for all of them. Except Judas. Because his heart, he just didn't do that honesty of heart. That's, you know, that he should have done. Because that's God would have had mercy on him too. You know why I know this? God is no respecter of persons. And God is a just and a righteous God. So he, I know that he did the same thing for all of them. It's just a shame that Judas went that way. And the lesson for all you and I now is to make sure you keep your heart with all diligence. It's not doing, it's not what you, it's the attitude. And the good thing about this heart thing is that you have control over it. You know why? You have a free will. So what's happening in your heart is your own, is you have, you can choose be humble, you can choose to be honest, or you can choose not to. Say, even Satan himself can't force you to do that. You, you decide that. You decide in your heart that God is like Peter, you know, like Peter, you know, like John, like others. God help them. In spite of all their faults, God will help you. Let us pray. Let's talk to God. God will help you. These are great lessons that are inside the scriptures for us to learn. Learn from David, learn from Judas, learn from Joab, learn from Uriah. Great, 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 great lessons. Great lessons. Thank God we are the, we are the wonderful generation that, you know, the end of the world has come. So we, 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 we have an advantage in all that generation. Has. We can look back. They had... They, they had things to look back, but not as much as we do. So we can do far better. We can do far better. We must do far better. You shouldn't make the mistake of David. You shouldn't make the mistake of Joab. You shouldn't make the mistake of Judas. You know, you can learn from it. So these are written for admonition so that we don't make those same mistakes. That's the whole purpose of reading the Bible preaching the Bible, studying the Bible so you can learn and you can take advantage of and learn from those mistakes and then you can take the power of the Holy Spirit, eat his flesh and drink his blood. You can have power to overcome all those things. Talk to God. You are the peace that guards my heart. My help in time of need You are the hope that leads me on And brings me to my knees For here For here I find you waiting And here And here I find relief So with all my heart So with all my heart I wish and unto you and unto you I say Lord you alone deserve all glory Lord you alone deserve all praise Father we worship and adore you Father we long to
to see your face. Lord, you alone deserve all glory. Lord, you alone deserve all praise. Father, we love you and we worship you this day. You are the peace. Sing it. You are the peace that guards my heart. My help in time of need. You are the hope. You are the hope that leads me on and brings me to my knees. For here, for here I find you waiting. And here I find really so with all my heart. Sing. Raise your other hand to God. In these many, many weeks, months really, there's been an unrelenting emphasis of the Holy Spirit upon about the heart. We're going to pray together in a minute. I just want you in your heart. Talk to God from your heart. May not even be saying words, just your thoughts. Just say, Lord, I love you. Help me. God never turns down a cry for help. Never. Never. Even the man in unbelief. He said, Lord, help thou my unbelief. And he helps him. The man was honest enough to admit he had unbelief. He said, if thou can help us, if I can do anything, Jesus said, all things are possible to him. That He was a rebuke. The man said, ah, Lord, help my unbelief. That's all God is looking for, folks. I've walked this thing enough to know this. The Syrophoenician woman, he called her a dog. There is not meat to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. The woman responded with the right heart attitude. She said, yes. I'm a gentle and we're dogs. And it's true. He said, but even the dogs get the crumbs. Immediately, Jesus helped her. Be honest. Talk to God. We're going to pray in a minute. Be honest. Talk to God. If you're hypocritical, say, Lord, help my hypocrisy. If you're whatever it is, just say, Lord, help me. Help me. Help me. Don't hide it all. God's God knows it's there. You're not saying it for God's benefit. You're saying it for your own benefit. 
That's it. That's the way forward. See, who shall ascend unto his holy hill? He that speaketh the truth in his heart. Psalm 15, Psalm 24. Who shall ascend unto the holy hill of the Lord? Raise that hand. Put the other one on your heart. Say, Father, we confess our sins so we cling with the blood. So we cling with the blood from all unrighteousness. In Jesus' name we have life. Lord, have mercy on us as we pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word that has come to me this evening, reminding me that it is your will for me to sit on your throne. That's my destiny. But you have also shown me tonight that my dream is locked in the dream of others. Help me, Lord. Have mercy on me to take joy out of helping the dreams of others. Help me to be faithful in that which is another man's so that I will finally get that which is my own. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Give me the heart of a servant. Help me to use my spirit as a conduit pipe to serve others. Lord, help me delight in serving others. The more people I can serve, the greater I become in the kingdom. Help me. Help me. Help me to be a servant at heart in Jesus' name. Ninka tolo macardo fredesk, lombri di che tu schi frinenza, lombri di a scia che tu fridisk, don gardo lo masciocco tu lo mongoro, ma si lozza la briga tu lo matolo matu frinenga scioco tu lo matolos, lombri che clama tu lo matu fridu frisci gars, neha scioco tu fre, lombri che clama come, tu lo matu fridu fridu frisci, tu lo masciangar tu lo matu fre, lombri che clama tu lo scelepi tu frines, no frines, no frines, giki tu frines, non gare clama tu los. Ziki tu fridi ke klamatolos, nu fridez, nos ko fridez, longer delas, ziki tu fridelas, tolo mangor dolo ma tu fridez, tolo ma tu fridez, tu fridez, tu fridez, tu fridez, in Jesus name. Say in Jesus name we have life. Father, give life to our spirits now, and that in a measure that is more than enough, to enable us praise and worship God, effectually and fervently, as we worship God now with our offerings and as we minister unto the Lord in Jesus' name, amen. Let's give a lot of super clap offering, if you will. Trust you and obey as your spirit. 
God of heaven. Heaven is your throne, the earth is your footstool. The Holy One of Israel, the mighty God of Jacob, 
the covenant keeping God of Abraham, the strength of Israel, who will not lie. We worship and honor you tonight. Lord Jesus, mighty God, Prince of Peace, the everlasting root and offspring of Jacob, yea, the bride and morning star. We worship and honor and give you glory, for you truly alone are worthy. Lord, Holy Spirit, the glory of God that raised up Jesus from the dead, Jehovah Makadesh, the great sanctifier, the God that is more than enough. We bless and we honor you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. In royal robes. for changing us from within. We got more like our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, we return to you all the glory and worship of heavenly Father. Lord Jesus, our shepherd and king, the example that we all follow after. We thank you for your word. Thank you for our Lord God, a changing from there, transforming us, O Lord God, as we hold your beauty in the world to be like you and to walk like you. We say thank you for your love. Lord Holy Spirit, your sweet presence is a manifest and tangible in this place tonight. We know it's not everywhere you choose to visit. We thank you because you have chosen to come this evening and to tabernacle here with us, causing us to hear the mind of Christ, causing us to be changed from within. Lord, to be Lord, more like Christ as we leave here tonight in the world we came. We are deeply grateful and take absolutely nothing for granted. Let us come, Lord, and continue to work in us, with us, and through us, to will and to do all of our Father's will, and to finish this course that has been laid out for us. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for this day. And as a token of our love and gratitude, we come to bring these tithes and offerings unto you, Lord, to worship you with the same present them to you first. Lord Jesus, you are the high priest of our tithes and offerings. We come to bring these tithes and offerings to you that you also might have somewhat to offer. We worship you with them. I should receive them with our love. And please, Lord, help us present the same to our Father also. So, Father, we thank you for everyone you've been able to give into your offering tonight. We ask that in your mercy, in your loving kindness, you look down upon us and grant each one a full return, causing us to have good measure, pressed down and shaken together, running over of knowledge, of understanding, of wisdom and skill. We ask you to give us divine guidance, grant us strength with ability and favor with you and the sons of men. So we'll continue to prosper, to excel, and thereby increase and have even more with which to worship you next time around in the name of Jesus. Father in heaven, for those who sincerely in their hearts wanted to give tonight but were not able to do so physically, we plead for mercy. You who give seed to the sown bread to eat will grant them seed that they too might sow. And as they sow their seed, we ask that you also grant them, Lord, and cause them to become established in the principles of seed planting and harvesting, giving and receiving so they will reap a continual harvest and never again have to come before you empty-handed in the name of Jesus. Lord, for our fathers who are custodians over these funds, we ask that these same blessings be ministered unto them with wisdom to manage and disburse these funds judiciously for the furtherance of your kingdom upon the earth, for the glory of the name of Jesus, and for the blessing of humanity. We give you thanks and worship and honor our God in the name of Jesus. The Buddha tithes tonight, kindly raise your hand, a physical, symbolic, a highly significant act of faith and patience. And Father in heaven, for those who have come to worship you, bring them the first fruits of the increase in obedience to your word tonight. We command and open heavens over your lives in the name of Jesus. The Lord cause a fresh release of the power of the Spirit upon the ground of your hearts in the name of Jesus. And the Lord rebuke the devourer for your sake. 
You will not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither will your vine cast its fruit before its time of the field. But rather, the granite house will bring forth abundantly, spiritually, materially, and, phys and financially in due season. For the Lord makes your delight some land, and all nations call you blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we thank you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. And the Holy Spirit, that you can give you. We turn to you all the honor, all the glory. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Amen. Wow. Sounds like everybody's sober. So. <laughs> Amen. I can imagine. I, I feel probably the same way too. I'm telling you. What a wonderful word. Thank God for that wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. We're deeply grateful. We want to thank all of you also for taking the time out to be here, to join with us, to come to hear what the Spirit has been saying to the church this night. And we want to thank God for choosing to visit with us. We've come to the end of our service. We have one or two announcements to make. First of all, there's an announcement here for the choir. They're having their fasting and praying meeting tomorrow here at 6 p.m. So all the members of the priest, all the members of the choir, please take note. Your prayer and fasting day is tomorrow. The time is 6 p.m. So please have you take note. On Friday, we're going to have our uh, uh, no, just the church. The Zion City, forgive me, how can I put that? Zion City Fellowship will take place on Friday evening, and so please let all the members of the Zion City Fellowship take note. So 5.30 p.m., and there's a one hour before at 4.30 p.m. Please invite your friends so they come, and they come to hear what the Lord is saying in the Zion Church. And the Zion City Fellowship on Friday evening, also on Friday evening. We have the leaders and carriers meeting at 6 p.m. in the upper room. And then, then every every single morning between now and Sunday and, in, and continuing, we have our early morning meeting with Good Morning Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. We had our first anniversary yet uh, on Monday. Amen. And the new year has begun. Amen. As we want to continue in that vein, and increase and expand our borders and enlarge our coast. So we invite you to invite others as you can. As you can see, we start at 5 o'clock. No, you can't see. Okay, can we pull up the announcement, please? Good morning, Jesus. Thank you. Start at 5 o'clock in the morning. There's a 5 to 6, and then there's a 6 to 7. We're invited to come and join both if you can. And if you can, at least make sure you're there for the 5 o'clock. And my pastor says, please make sure you try and wake up a little bit earlier. So you can pray a little bit and prepare your heart and your spirit to be maximum uh, participator of the prayer meeting that you're going to be at, a part of. So please, that's, where's the announcement? Please, can you put up the announcement? Good morning, Jesus. Thank you. Hello. Okay, anyways, good morning, Jesus. Five o'clock to six o'clock every morning, six to seven. To, uh, uh, six, five to six and six to seven for the WAT and GMT respectively every morning until Jesus comes. Amen. And then on Saturday, we have our regular Gideon's Army Prayer Meeting. Amen. Starting at 8 o'clock in the morning. And then we do the uh, Enforcing the Kingdom thereafter. And please let's all be punctual and present. The Lord will have mercy upon us as we come. Saturday. Okay, so Saturday morning, at 8 o'clock in the morning, and then we have immediately after that, the Gideon's Army Prayer Meeting, immediately after that, the Enforcing the Kingdom Prayer. So please let's all take note, and be present, and let's be punctual. Lord, will have mercy upon us in the name of Jesus. Amen. We'll now take the grace and fellowship as we close to the benediction of the Father. So amen. So we arise, please. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you. Lord, lift up the light of his countenance upon you. The Lord, God gives you peace. God makes you head and not tail, above only and not beneath. Everything you set your hand to is successful. You are at least ten times better than your pairs. You possess the gates of your enemies, even the gate of death. So you will live, you will not die. 
You will live and declare the glory of God in the land of the living. With long life will God satisfy you and show you his salvation in the perfection and fullness of Christ. So Lord impart to you the anointings of Enoch, Abraham, Joseph, of uh, Moses, Joshua, Ruth, David, Elisha, Daniel, Esther, Paul, and John. In Jesus' name, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the sweet fellowship of the blessed Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, you can never say you keep your heart with all diligence. God bless you. Have a great night. Day G, family Lucy, come and see me.